Hello everyone, I'm Perfon and recently I've been refactoring some of the core systems of Blasternaut game. In this video I will tell you how I've done it and I will share my quite clever concept for storing the game's data. In the last video I described how I tried to add multi-trading to the Blasternaut's third generation. And eventually it turned out that the slowest part of the algorithm was placing new tiles to the tile map. However, I never showed you how the word generation itself was actually done. And the main reason was that this part of the code was quite ugly. And I knew that sooner or later I had to rewrite it. And the cool looking tile sets that you can see in the current clip are only possible because that's what I did. So now, as it's done, let's scroll back some time and check out an earlier version from the kit to see what actually has changed. So, here's the familiar tilemap chunk script that starts the processes for generating chunk and updating chunk. And those methods were located in map generator. Now, the map generator, it's quite a monster, as you can see. It prepares all the tiles and then does a lot of individual calculations for each tile type to generate them. For example, the update chunk, it runs through all the tiles in the chunk and calls update visuals. The update visuals updates the back tile visuals and also the front tile visuals. And the update block visuals is the function where the monster lies. So first it calculates some noise values and based on that noise it places different blocks like mushrooms, grass, crystal, also all the mineral blocks one by one. After that, it also places the gemstones and eventually it calculates different light values and places some regular blocks as well. So as you can see, it's not just uh, ugly, but also it doesn't scale very well. So every time I wanted to add a new block, I first had to add it to the tile set. Then I had to add the corresponding type, also assign icons and values to the block. And finally, I had to integrate it to the word generation. So yeah, it was fine for the first prototyping, but now I needed something better. And the better approach would be to do everything automatically based on some game data. And for storing game data in Godot, there are two primary options. Let's compare them. First, there are resource files. These are similar to Unity's scriptable objects. And it means that we define a class which instances are stored in game's resource folder. But there are some things that I don't like about them. First, it creates a lot of tiny files that are hard to keep track of and fill with data. Secondly, Godot's support for resource files is not as good as it could be. They are referenced by their paths and I had a situation where their data just mysteriously disappeared, which was extremely frustrating. And resource files are also not accessible to the users, so adding the modding support would be quite difficult. All right, what is the other option then? It's the JSON data. In Godot, the arrays and dictionaries follow exactly the JSON syntax. And this means that any JSON file can be parsed into Godot's array and dictionary combination. And this actually solves the aforementioned issues. The format is quite compact and easy to edit. It can be edited in any text editor and it can also be exposed to the users so that they can make their own data. However, storing the data just in arrays and dictionaries has its own set of problems. So first of all, some of the data can be missing 
or incompatible, which was not the case for the resource files, as there is always default data in there. Secondly, compared to resource files, it's not as easy to add some processing or additional methods to the data. And finally, the dictionary lookups will definitely be slower than object property access. So, which one to use then? Well, maybe we don't have to choose, because my solution is to combine them both. So this is how I've done it. The data is stored in JSON files, and these can be stored in resource folder or user accessible data folder. But for each data file, there is also the corresponding class. And Godot allows to loop over objects properties, which means that after the data is loaded, it can be automatically assigned to the correct object fields. Furthermore, this matching process can also parse vectors and colors and other types. And for matching nested classes, I've made this clever trick where every object field has this corresponding type variable and the value of the type variable is a script that is used to instantiate the object. So yeah, that's the data system in principle. And here is how the previously shown update method looks after the refactoring. It still starts by calculating the same noise, but then just loops over the biomes generation data. And this is same for all the blocks. It also allows me to add new biomes and blocks by just adding a few lines to the JSON data. And the tileset is now also created dynamically. And this made adding some new functionality much easier as well. I wanted to add those long vines and also some bigger plants. And the easiest way to do that was to assign bigger tiles. But when I did it, I noticed something bad. Continuously placing those tiles over 30 seconds or so degraded the block placement performance. And at first it really freaked me out. But then I discovered that the performance loss was not because the tiles were bigger, but because I assigned them to a different C depth. And luckily that was easy to solve by just assigning those tiles to a different tile map that's drawn on top. Unfortunately, I discovered that the performance loss also happens with animated tiles that have a different material and are animated by a shader. Those tiles are also not patched and currently I don't have a good solution for them. And we'll just keep a checkbox in the settings to turn the animations off. So yeah, in the end, I'm really happy about how it turned out. And before I wrap up this video, I would like to answer some of the questions that were asked in YouTube comment section. So first of all, in the end, I turned the multi-threading back on because after all of this refactoring, I was able to see some performance improvement from the multi-threading. Some of you recommended to use arrays instead of dictionaries. And I totally agree that arrays are much more efficient data structures. However, they are a little bit harder to work with. In my case, I have to check a lot of boundaries and also fill them with zeros if there are gaps between the tiles. And because it didn't appear to be the bottleneck right now, I will postpone this refactoring for the future. Another great recommendation was to use the C sharp language instead. And I have to say, it is a little tempting. When I started with this project, I was really happy with Godot script. And I had a great time writing this compact and beautiful language. But there are some things that the Godot script can't really do very well. And that's mostly IDE support. And also not seeing minor errors before playtesting is getting a little bit tiresome. And on top of that, I actually have a major issue with Visual Studio Code crashing 
and not reporting errors until I restart it. And that problem appears out of nowhere. I have no idea how to reproduce it. So for now, I just have to learn to live with it and hopefully it will get fixed in Godot version 4. But if you had encountered the same issue, please let me know. But for now, I will stick to GDScript, mainly because I'm quite invested into it and I would rather spend my time adding new and cool stuff instead of remaking the old one. Alright, that was all. And I have to say, I'm really grateful for all the nice suggestions that you wrote in, in the comments, so thank you for that. And I will see you again in the next video.